pre-legislative scrutiny of the company's Corporate Enforcement Authority Bill 2018. Members will recall that the general scheme of the company's Corporate Enforcement Authority Bill was referred to this committee on the 4th of December. At our meeting on the 22nd of January, the committee agreed that it would undertake pre-legislative scrutiny of the general scheme. I would like to welcome the following officials from the Department of Business, Enterprise and in Innovation. Ms. Sarah Green, Ms. Aideen Collins, Ms. Helen Curley, Mr. Matthew Day and Mr. John Marr. In accordance with procedure, I am required to read the following. By virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. If you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to so do, you are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make cha change charges against any person or entity by name or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that members should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the houses or an official, either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. I would remind our guests that the presentation should be no more than 10 minutes. Members have been circulated with the presentation submitted by today's attendees. I now ask Ms Green to make the presentation, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much for the, the opportunity. Um, as you will have seen from looking at the general scheme, it covers a number of areas, which is why there are three company law sections uh, represented here today from the department. So the, the general scheme of the company's Corporate Enforcement Authority Bill gives effect to two of the 14 measures that were published in uh, last November 2017, I should say, uh, entitled Measures to Enhance Ireland's Corporate Economic and Regulatory Framework. It was also subtitled Ireland Combating White Collar Crime. The two measures in that package of measures in this bill are firstly to establish the Office of the Director of Corporate Enforcement as an agency that is better equipped to investigate increasingly complex breaches of company law and to implement recommendations of the Company Law Review Group on corporate governance. The general scheme has also taken the opportunity to do a few other things, so it implements recommendations also of the Company Law Review Group on shares and share capital, and it introduces some new transparency measures with respect to companies, the conduct of liquidations and the register of companies. So I'll take each of the above in turn. Firstly, the establishment of the ODCE as an agency. As uh, already mentioned, this was part of the government's decision in uh, October, November 2017 to establish the ODCE as an agency with a commission type structure distinct from the department. Therefore, this general scheme provides for the establishment of the ODC as an agency with the name Corporate Enforcement Authority. The Commission structure is modelled on the Competition and Consumer Protection Commission and therefore many of the provisions are inspired by provisions in the legislation that established that Commission. In some cases, the recent legislation establishing the Data Protection Commission has also served as a precedent. The new authority will have between one and three commissioners, one to be chairperson, and each will be appointed by the minister following a recruitment process conducted by the Public Appointment Service. This structure and flexibility is intended to allow the authority to adapt if its works load expands significantly or if it needs to organise its work into discrete areas or functions. Another feature of the scheme with respect to the authority's autonomy is that it provides the authority uh, that it will be able to determine itself the skills, levels and numbers of staff that it will need to conduct its work, subject to overall budgetary sanction and approval. All of the functions that the ODC currently has are going to be carried over to the new authority, including encouraging in compliance with the Companies Act 2014, investigations of suspected offences and non-compliance, and prosecution of summary offences and referring indictable offences to the DPP. Also, the exercise of certain supervisory functions with respect to liquidators and receivers. The scheme also includes savers for any work that is currently underway at the time of the transfer from the OEC to the authority. The government has also decided uh, back in 2017 to better equip the new authority to investigate increasingly complex breaches of company law. So while the current range of powers that the ODCE has are going to be carried over, some new investigative tools have been identified and added. 
The first of these is a development of the current power of search and entry at Head 46. Here the intention is to uh, meet the kind of the changes that there are from technological advances and to allow the authority to get a search warrant to be able to search for electronic records that a company may hold on a server that's remote from the company or to be able to use its own equipment where the equipment of the company is maybe a little slow or old. This is new ground and if it turns out to be a feasible thing this power will be of interest to other investigative bodies such as on guard the Shia So for this reason and to ensure that it is workable, robust and includes appropriate safeguards, the Department will be developing this provision in consultation with the offices of the Attorney General, the Parliamentary Council and the Department of Justice and Equality. Another new tool is the provision in Head 45 on the admissibility of written statements. This is a statutory exemption from the hearsay rule, allowing the courts to consider written statements as evidence in certain circumstances, and is modelled on a provision in the Competition and Consumer Protection Act. Alongside those provisions, uh, the Department is working with the Department of Justice with a view to giving the new authority a power under the forthcoming Communication Retention of Data Bill to apply directly to the courts to retain specified telecommunication records in the, for an investigation. The general scheme also introduces new measures with respect to liquidations that are designed to enhance the authority's powers. Firstly, part five introduces a new ground for the authority or others to apply to the courts for an order that would restrict a person's ability to act as a company director. In particular, it enables the authority to apply for a restriction order where a director of a company has failed to meet certain requirements in the course of that company becoming insolvent. This is intended to address the situation where a director does not conduct an orderly winding up of a company. A consequence of this can be that creditors, including employees, uh, are unable to get paid from the company's remaining resources or, in some cases, get access to the state's insolvency fund. This is based on a recommendation of the Company Law Review Group on the protection of employees and unsecured creditors. Another new provision with respect to liquidation is that the scheme provides a power for the authority to request that a person acting as a liquidator provide evidence to the authority that they are indeed qualified to act as a liquidator in accordance with the requirements of the Companies Act. Turning to the recommendations of the Company Law Review Group, the scheme gives effect to recommendations including, included in two of their reports. These are the report on corporate governance and the reports on shares and share capital. These provisions are encompassed in parts three and four of the scheme, and most may be categorised as technical in that they address omissions, provide clarifications, or rectify perceived anomalies. As a result, they arise from the large consolidation and modernisation product project that took place between 2012 and 2014 and resulted in the Companies Act 2014. Part three is concerned with shares and shares capital. These uh, are intended to rectify perceived anomalies regarding share capital following the reform of company law. They reinstate provisions or clarifications from the now repealed Companies Acts 63 to 2013 concerning the use of a company's share premium account, the payment of commission to investors in a share issue of a PLC, and the law concerning the share management of unlimited companies. In other cases, they are just clarifications of the existing law. Part four is intended to clarify certain corporate governance and other issues affecting the administration of company meetings. Again, their purpose is to address anomalies, unforeseen consequences, and reaffirming the overall policy approach to the legislation. As mentioned earlier, then, we have provisions on restriction orders for directives that are based on a third report of the CLRG. Then we have taken the opportunity to introduce some measures that are designed to improve corporate transparency. The first of these is Head 42, which is concerned with the frequency at which liquidators must submit their reports to the company's registration office. At the moment, only periods of six months or longer may be prescribed. However, a gap can arise where there are fewer than six months uh, between an interim report and the final report. So uh, Head 42 will facilitate the submission of interim reports more frequently where it's necessary to address that gap. Head 43 introduces a requirement for directors of Irish registered companies to provide their PPSN, personal, private, uh, 
I've forgotten, sorry, what the acronym is, um, to the company's registration office. This information will not be publicly available, but will enable the CRO to verify the accuracy of information supplied to it on foot of the statutory obligations in the Companies Act. As well as supporting accuracy, this is intended to address the situation where one person uses different versions of their name, so in some cases just initials or just their middle name, uh, in order to, uh, on various company returns, sorry, in order to appear that they are more than one person or to avoid the prohibition on holding more than 25 directorships at any one time. Finally, Head 47 proposes the deletion of an exemption from the rule that companies include the names of their directors on their company letterhead correspondence. This exemption came in in 1963 when the change of director would require a new print run of stationery every time in order to comply. But in light of technological advances, this exemption seems no longer to be justified. So uh, I'm happy now to, to take questions. Um, thank you, Ms. Green. I'm just going to start with one question on page two, and it's the very first paragraph. Um, the scheme also includes savers for work already underway at the time of the transfer from the ODC to the authority. Could you just explain that a little bit? I presume that that's work already underway will be, is that what it means? That it yes, will be it means, for example, yes, if they had any cases or investigations that they had already started, because if you think about it, the transfer will just be overnight. So. Uh, Proceedings might have been issued in the name of the Director of Corporate Enforcement, so you don't want those to, to fall on the basis of a technicality like that. So any work they're currently undergoing will automatically transfer to the new yes. agency? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, who wants to go first? Deputy Kelleher? Just, um, is it a sad indictment on a department that an agency can't function under the remit of a department? In the sense that why is it necessary always to transfer out of a department for it to function properly? I mean, why aren't departments capable of managing it themselves. So you have an Office Director for Corporate Enforcement. It has been a failed entity to date, um, an appallingly failed entity, in fact, um, bordering on negligence. But leaving that aside, why is it always necessary to move an entity out of the department for it to function properly? Why do departments not allow them, or are they incapable as departments, of allowing this entity to operate within the department? Yes, sorry, yes. Okay. Well, I suppose I'll, I'll start with that, that. The reason that the government has decided that it should, be, it should have greater autonomy and be separate from the department, one of them is that as an office of the department, it is really like another section of the department. So it's part of the pool of resources that are available to the department. Once it goes separate and autonomous, it has much more control over its own uh, resources. So for example, at the moment, if it was looking for IT people, it would be just one of the requests that comes into our human resources section looking for IT. And if the priorities of the department as a whole uh, mean that resources all have to be put into a different area, then the uh, Director of Corporate Enforcement's office may be lower down on the list of priorities. Once it's standalone, it has, it has more control over its own resources. It's not competing, competing maybe is not the right word, but it's not part of the pool of the whole department. The maybe. department is the paymaster. They, well, the department is the entity that decides the budget of this agency. In consultation with the Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, yes. Um, yes, I, I'd just like to add as well that um, we are taking into account some of the lessons learned from um, Judge Aylmer's findings uh, as well, and, and we are uh, transferring um, the office to an agency. Just to, to enhance the autonomy, it's a very specialised skill set. That was one of the shortcomings that the judge found. Um, was that there were staffing and skills issues. The office at the time did not have the depth of experience in criminal investigations. It's a very specialised skill set that is required within the agency. They will need to um, have greater autonomy to recruit those specialised resources and also to retain those specialised resources because as Saba has said, there is at the moment an office will have that mobility structure that people can move in and out into the department. But the agency, when it is fully established at, as an agency, um, the staff will be dedicated um, resources 
for that agency. So it's increasing their ability to uh, recruit and retain staff, um, enhancing it really beyond what the uh, office has at the moment. It will have greater control of, over the deployment of its resources, so it will be flexible enough to restructure itself to cope with, for example, a significant increase in caseload as we, um, as we had in the office um, in 2008. Um, it will provide a dedicated career path within the agency, a specialised career path, and also as an agency of the department, they will have sanction to replace staff on a like-for-like -like basis without having to come directly to the department for sanction. Uh, and they will have the ability, um, subject to the consent of the, both our, uh, the Department of Business and the Department of Public Expenditure, to appoint its own staff and determine their grades. Okay, and just, just finally then, um, in view of the fact that Mr. Uh, Drennan has uh, you know, analysed the failure on the, in the Sean Fitzpatrick uh, trial and its collapse and I suppose the gross incompetence and um, almost bordering on uh, what neg negligence, even potential criminality in terms of how some of that case was conducted. Um, that report uh, Mr. Drennan drafted it was sent to the minister and subsequently uh, could not be published because of the Attorney General's advice. Um, but I suppose the question is, in drafting this legislation and trying to ensure that we don't repeat the mistakes that were repeated in that particular shambles, um, how did you assess it without seeing it? Or how did you take from the report of Mr Drennan? Or have you seen it? Or has it been read? Or has anybody read it? Or how, how do we know that the legislation that's coming forward here will be compatible with the aims and objectives of ensuring that the mistakes in the Fitzpatrick trial, uh, particularly the administrative side of the Office Director of Corporate Enforcement, its prosecutorial role and its failures around governance and, uh, and everything else that was named in the Elmer report, and also in the context of the trial itself, was clearly exposed of tampering with statements and witnesses. And, uh, how do we know that this particular legislation will underpin an office that won't repeat those mistakes based on the fact that Mr Drennan has issued a report that nobody can act on because we can't see it. Oh, sorry, thank you. Um, thank you, Deputy. Uh, well, I certainly have read the report and um, the account that was published uh, outlines the findings of Judge Aylmer. Judge Aylmer's ruling itself is extremely clear. He has identified uh, very clearly the investigative shortcomings. And really, they, they, um, in essence, they are around, um, particularly around the collection of evidence. That was the most significant shortcoming. So that led to um, some of the judge's um, findings around contamination of uh, witness statements. Those were procedural issues as opposed to a weakness in the legislation. Judge Aylmer didn't find any deficiencies in the legislative process. Um, however, it is clear that um, procedures need to be changed and they have been changed to make sure now that a GAR that takes the lead in collection of um, evidence from witnesses and the staff of the office themselves have undergone specialised training in witness statements. The bill builds on those reforms in the collection of evidence by um, promoting the ongoing very close working relationship that the office has with um, on GAR the Shia Khanna. So the, the bill um, builds on, on that work to date and um, fosters the ongoing uh, good working relationship. The other issue then was that the office, they lacked the depth of experience in um, criminal investigations, which led to some of the uh, shortcomings in the collection of evidence. Um, that pointed to the need for specialist recruitment and um, the lack of forensic capability was another forensic accountant capability uh, at the time for the scale of the multiple um, investigations that was being undertaken. It also pointed to the lack of in-house digital expertise. Those reforms have been addressed, but obviously the office will continue to evolve. Its skills needs will be reviewed on an ongoing basis. And uh, as Saba has outlined, and I outlined as well, the office um, as an agency, it will have enhanced powers to recruit and retain staff. So that speaks to some of the um, skills and staffing uh, deficiencies. 
And also, I think a key finding was that the office wasn't uh, equipped to undertake multiple complex investigations in parallel. Um, that is something that the new structure will address. So the structure, as set out in the bill, is with a, a commissioner-type structure, and that will allow the flexibility for the organisation to change its um, working structures and relationships to cope with an increase um, in, in uh, workload. Uh, and also just building on the, um, the digital um, uh, the lack of digital capability that existed at the time. We have, um, the office has recruited a digital forensic specialist, forensic accountants. It's built um, a, a new digital infrastructure, but also the bill, even though um, um, legislative deficiencies weren't identified, we have considered some of the um, enhanced powers that the agency may need, and one of those, as um, my colleague explained in the opening introduction, is enhanced powers of search and entry um, for, for digital for, um, information storage digitally. So we are evolving the bill to enhance the capacity of the office. We are addressing the skills issues. We are addressing the collection of evidence issues in the bill. Thank you. And may I add yes, sorry. one thing is um, you spoke about uh, the, the confidentiality around uh, the director's report and how it's, uh, it's difficult for legislators now to match up uh, what's in the bill. But one of the things as well that is changing in the bill is the, you may remember that uh, Mr. Drennan's report was given under Section 955 of the, the current legislation. So that's been slightly changed in the heads. And now, uh, if the, the other confidentiality provisions in 956 will be carried over because you have to protect the investigation uh, and all of that. But 955 is slightly changed now that the chairperson of the new authority will be accountable to a committee such as, as this. And if the committee asks for, for information where it's not clear whether or not it can be disclosed, then there is a provision to go to the High Court and a judge will decide whether or not it can be uh, given to the committee. So that's an, a new provision in the heads. Okay, thank you. Deputy Quinlivan. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> just back to the report that Mr. Drennan did, and obviously we haven't seen sight of it, nobody's seen sight of it, and you've come forward with the new heads of bills here for the new bill that obviously how do we know what to go with when we don't know exactly what what was the problems that you know that was highlighted in that report or whatever so some some of the questions i want to ask is do you believe the odce at the moment is currently fit for purpose as it is um, yes. so is it presently currently fit for purpose um yes certainly the odc is fit for purpose it has um um, I believe a very strong uh, track record. I mean, just to put this into context, there were a number of um, investigations in parallel, and this is the only, there was only one uh, where um, adverse um, shortcomings were identified. So it, the office does have um, a good track record in terms of prosecutions. Uh, it has a number of high-profile prosecutions, a lot of um, activity as well, 2007 to 2018, uh, over 1,860 directors are restricted, um, over 240 directors disqualified. Uh, it must be remembered also as well that the ODCE undertakes um, a very proportionate uh, approach to company law enforcement in order to free up time in the courts and free up the, the time of businesses where the serious um, uh, corporate um, breaches of company law are not um, in question. They do undertake a proportionate regime where they, do, they um, offer advice, they issue directions um, if the crimes are not, uh, or the uh, breaches are not very uh, serious. Then they move on to um, a prosecution or a voluntary undertaking, which has been an activity since 2015, again, to free up time in the courts. So they do have um, a very good track record, both of the high profile cases. There are certainly four um, I, I could refer to since 2014. I have the details of those available. They also have an ongoing um, work that they're doing, advocacy work, and they do undertake a lot of work in restrictions and uh, disqualifications as well. So you're telling us then that you, you don't believe it's, you do believe it's fit for purpose. So why then are we coming with a new agency? What's the point of a new agency if this one is fit for purpose? 
Well, it's again, it's about the greater autonomy for the agency, and it was a government decision. Could that not be done under the existing organisation? It's, they will have greater autonomy in replacing like-for-like like staff and in retaining staff within um, uh, um, their corporate uh, structure under the new agency regime. For, for instance, like uh, currently, would you be satisfied that the, um, the ODC is, is, is robustly, for instance, investigating um, prosecuting breaches of the Companies Act, for instance? That is doing that. Is yeah. robustly, robustly doing that? Um, yes, they do have the track record. They have secured um, prosecutions. They are sending the files on to the DPP, and they are um, the DPP make the decision on the prosecution, and the DPP is making that prosecution. The office um, is extremely well equipped at the moment, uh, also in terms of its specialist skill staff, so that it has the capability um, to undertake uh, those. Um, to undertake its functions, and I think its track record speaks to the delivery um, of its um, delivery of results. Okay, can, roughly, can I just ask um, what do you reckon the budget would be for the new agency? Um, excuse me, I have the, the budget here. We have um, secured an extra one million one. for the agency in 2019, just to assist with the establishment um, of the agency. Um, and €740,000 is uh, to assist with um, an additional, it's, a, it's an additional pay budget uh, for the agency and we are identifying any specific um, posts that will be required as part of the work underway to establish the agency. So can I clarify that? So it's one million extra to establish the agency. And in 2019. In 2019 to establish it. To establish it in addition to the ongoing budget. 740,000 for extra additional staff? No, it's 1 million in total, of which 740,000 okay. is staff. So the 2019 budget will be 6.057 million euro. But do you think the 740 is enough for the additional staff you recommend it in your, in your, in your submission that we need it? Like investigative detectives and forensic scientists or forensic investigators? Or we have a lot of those in place at the moment and they're covered within the existing. Uh, pay structure of the agency. Further work will need to be undertaken just to define, particularly in the operational side of things, and also um, any further specialist skills that are required will be considered as part of the um, establishment of the agency. Okay, look, I, I, and I assume it's, it's not your decision of what funding you get or whatever, that's going ultimately down to the Minister, but if we're serious about tackling white collar crime and we're just investing invest in an extra 740,000, I don't think we're taking this seriously because I don't, you know, there's a perception out there that if you don't pay your TV licence or if you don't pay something simple, you, you'll be prosecuted, but if you do a white collar crime, you get off with it. And I think that's sending out obviously the wrong signal that there's not enough funding there for it. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you. If, if I could just continue on the same line of question um, as Deputy Quinn Livin. Um, Deputy Quinn Livin asked you there, did you believe the ODCE was fit for purpose? And you believe it is. Um, and I'm not just trying to put you on, on the spot. But Judge Aylmer, as Deputy Keller has said, was absolutely scathing um, after the collapse of the, the, the Fitzpatrick trial in relation to the role of the ODCE in relation to various different things, um, shredding of documents, with, uh, witness coaching, all these different things. Has there been any change since that trial collapsed? Has there been any change in personnel in the ODCE that would make you um, real, that would make you state that it's now fit for purpose? Because obviously that was a damning indictment from Judge Aylmer, in my opinion, and I think many more people agree it was a damning indictment. And if there hasn't been any changes in personnel since that trial collapsed, why would you think it would be fit for purpose now? Um, thank you, Deputy. Um, I suppose it would be important to point out that this particular investigation took place between 2008 and 2012. And to address your specific question, we have had quite a number of um, changes of staff personnel. I mean, the current director um, came in, in in 2012. A huge amount of reform has taken place uh, in recent years in the ODCE. Speaking to the specialist recruitment, um, eight forensic accountants were recruited, of whom seven are, are in place at the moment, two enforcement portfolio managers, two enforcement lawyers, a digital forensic specialist. So these are the new specialist uh, cohort of staff that are there to complement the existing staff within the office and just bring a wealth 
of new skills. There has been training as well, uh, very specific training in the area of witness statements to um, cohorts of training because I, I mean, it's fully accepted that the standard of investigation was below um, par with the, um, with the, the particular investigation we're referring to. That is fully accepted. The deficiencies were in the um, capability, the skills available to the office, the depth of experience um, available. Those issues have been addressed. The training in the um, collection of witness statements and also procedural reform has taken place as well as the, the new staff that I, I referred to. Procedural reform in that there's um, every witness taking statement uh, will be led by a Garda and that, that is critical for the standards required for a criminal investigation. It's something that hadn't happened before, that should have happened before, but that is happening now. Okay, thank you. Just another question. Um, it was stated on page one, the new authority will have between one and three commissioners, one to be chairperson, and each will be appointed by the minister following a recruitment process. So it will be between one and three. Is that depending on the caseload or the workload, I should say? Yes. The idea is to give flexibility that, uh, because one of the criticisms in, in Judge Aylmer's uh, judgment was that they weren't equipped to take on board a number of big cases at the same time. So if that came for them again, they would be able to have an additional one or two commissioners to work with the chairperson and then you, know, you could have maybe one commissioner over one particular investigation separate from the rest of the work of the... Okay, and just my final question, um, are the proposed changes to the ODCE, in your opinion, adequate to address the issues raised by Judge Ilmer, or do you think we will see more changes going forward? I know um, it's only the heads of the bill, no bill, no bill is perfect in its infancy, it, they evolve, they change, there's amendments, but do you believe that um, you know, what you're proposing so far should be adequate to, to, to um, address the issues raised by Judge Ilmer? Well, uh, the way I would see it is, is the government has, has uh, you know, decided back in October, November of 2017 that they didn't just want to establish it as an agency with a commission structure, but also that they wanted it properly equipped. Mm. And you know, to that end, we have, uh, and the government has adopted this policy, has agreed to give some new powers that I've, I've outlined in my presentation. Um, there are also, as, as you may know, some other uh, reviews going on just at the moment. So, for example, the, the, um, there is a review group which was set up also under the package of measures to combat white-collar crime to look at anti-fraud and anti-corruption structures in Ireland. And that group is, is meeting at the moment and is due to report in the middle of this year, end of June. And so they may have some further recommendations that uh, would, the government would want to consider. Then uh, the company law review group has on its current work program enforcement of company law. So again, arising from that, we may get some, some additional ideas. But there is a lot in this in, no, in terms of, of giving. And, I, okay. I think and just my know. final question. Um, now, this is my, this is my, I am the chair. <laughs> just my final question now. Did you work closely with the ODCE um, when you were drafting the heads of this bill in relation to um, failures that were identified by Judge Aylmer? Did you, did you, you know, did you work with, 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 with the current um, chairman in order to, to draft these um, changes? We worked very closely with ODCE on preparing the Thank you. Bill. Thank you. Senator Riley. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I, look, I just want to thank the department because it clarified a good few things for me in their, their explanation of where things were at, particularly Ms. Collins, who has pointed out that the trial, you know, ended in 2012. A lot of these changes have taken place since 2012. Obviously, we want to have Mr. Drennan come in here to explain to us what's gone on and it was important to us that we would talk to you beforehand in the context of this bill. Um, I'd just like to clarify the relationship. So, is it proposed that the agency will be under the remit of the department with a quasi arms led relationship, a bit like TUSLA with the Department of Children and Youth Affairs or several other agencies that are under remit of departments but have a budget given to them through the department by the Minister? 
can you just give us a bit of detail on what's entailed there? Yeah, well, the heads provide that the minister will appoint the one, two or three commissioners. So that's the first connection. Um, the budget, uh, all of the funding, will be given with the consent of both uh, the Minister for Business, Enterprise and Innovation and the Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform. Uh, the heads also provide that the staff of the new agency will be civil servants. So there's another uh, connection. So, so yes. So it won't be public servants, they'll be civil servants. Civil servants. Okay. So the, the idea is that the minister would indeed have overall responsibility and accountability for uh, the, the agency. Right, so it'll be a slightly different relationship because the HSE are public servants. Right. Okay. Thank you. Order, Senator Riley. No, Deputy Neville, are you okay? Yeah, just again, look, a lot of the questions have been asked, but maybe, maybe if you could go over. Are, are there any other powers being considered by the new authority? And um, have the ODCE or, or other regulatory bodies requested any additional powers? Uh, we are still uh, discussing all of this with the ODCE, but a lot of it requires a great deal more kind of consideration and uh, engagement with, for example, the Department of uh, justice and equality because they have maybe consequences across the criminal justice system. So those have not been brought to government uh, as of yet okay. and, and may be in due course. And then as I mentioned earlier, there are other two reviews looking vaguely in this, I mean with a certain amount of overlap. The CLRG is very much in this area. The review group on anti-fraud and anti-corruption is touching on a lot of this area. So again, issues may come up out of those that would um, require new uh, provisions to be inserted into this. Thank you. Senator McLaughlin. Yeah. Um, as you know, the Law Reform Commission uh, in their report from last October, um, they, um, they recommended a, a corporate crime agency. Um, now, I, I recall I was previously a, a justice spokesperson, and I, I remember at the time um, there was a, a key contribution from Remy Farrell, who's a senior counsel, and he was heavily critical of, he said it's never been a better time for white collar crime, uh, and he referred to the dramatic under resourcing uh, of a range of agencies, uh, uh, the ODCE, um, at that time had one accountant which is absolutely shocking, um, the Gardo, Garda Bureau of, of Fraud Investigation, uh, the Garda Computer Crime Investigation Unit, um, uh, just uh, across a range of agencies there was dramatic under-resourcing um, and it made a mockery um, of, you know, we can consider that our state was brought down uh, and made bankrupt by the reckless behaviour uh, of people uh, in the white collar sector. Um, it, it is astounding um, that in 2014, which was you know six years um, after our state was you know collapsed, we had completely under-resourced the agencies responsible for ensuring proper regularity oversight of the the, the, the various business sectors. Um, and one of the strong recommendations from Remy Farrell and others uh, at the time was the need for one agency, one roof, where all of these matters were dealt with. And, and that's why I really would need a very strong uh, understanding as to why you're proceeding in this direction and not with a recommendation for a corporate crime agency from the Law Reform Commission. So that's my first question. Well, uh, first of all, the Law Reform Commission recommendations only came out at the end of October last year, and these heads had already been circulated internally within government um, with a view to them being uh, approved, uh, as, it w as it turned out, on the 4th of December. So they were a little late to, to get a really comprehensive um, uh, review. I should say the Law Reform Commission also starts off by recommending that we carry on with this um, proposal that the government had issued the year before to say that it wanted to establish the ODCE as a separate agency. It does, you're correct of course, that it does go on then to also talk about a national crime agency. But that is a much wider thing 
than just company law um, and it really needs a bit of thought. So that is one of the recommendations of the Law Reform Commission that is being considered by the review group on anti-fraud and anti-corruption structures. So it's not rejected, it's just being looked at because that group brings in Department of Justice, Gardaí, Central Bank, our department, ODC, a range of uh, stakeholders, competition and commission, consumer competition, Consumer and Protection Commission. Mm. So all of those are, are represented on the review mm. group. And as I said, that is due to make recommendations at the end of June. Uh, so that's where that recommendation is at. Could you foresee uh, this, this corporate uh, enforcement authority? Um, if you're, you're going to proceed with this legislation, uh, and I assume at this stage, obviously, that you are, um, could you foresee this, this new authority coming under an umbrella uh, of a corporate crime agency uh, being subsumed into a wider agency mm -hmm. at some stage? Um, well, obviously that will be a matter for the government to mm -hmm. decide in, in due course. I would say, in the meantime, um, you know, one of the things that comes out very clearly as well from the Law Reform Commission is the need for really strong coordination and cooperation mm -hmm. between all of the, the different bodies. And you know, we have information exchange uh, provisions on the, on the statutory level here in the heads, and there, will, there are existing memorandums of understanding, and those will have to be re, redone uh, because it will be a new authority. And uh, so we are trying to give them statutory support to make sure that there is clear-cut exchange of information and um, uh, coordination. Really working on what is largely there already. Um, that, to me, is in some ways more important than them all being under the one umbrella. The model that we have up to now in, in Ireland is that we create bodies who specialise in a particular area of law. So they become very specialist in that crime, for want of a better word. And then it doesn't matter whether it's committed by an individual, a corporation, somebody small or somebody big on a, on a small scale or a grand scale. Your expertise is in that area of law. Uh, so, for example, we have the Health and Safety Authority, we have the ODCE. That, that is the way we've been doing it. And to an extent, that has, has been working. So to move to a, an agency, and I think the LRC's recommendation kind of speaks about crimes that are committed on a big scale and by a big corporation. And when you start to investigate, you may not necessarily realize that this is a big deal. You know, if you're, if you're looking at it as a small fraud and then it becomes obvious. So th there are questions about then, at what stage do you elevate that up to another body? Um, so these are questions that have to be to be teased out um, in looking at those recommendations. But that's it would be a change from the current model of enforcement that we have. Mm. Uh, and then uh, in the LRC's report, they identify and recommend six core powers in terms mm. of financial and economic regulators. Uh, I'm not going to read them out, but you know yeah. you'll you'll be familiar with them. Uh, you know, do you? agree with, the, with that assessment? Do you, do you agree that those six powers are essential? And, and if you do, have you attempted to incorporate those into... Uh, and I appreciate your, your, your point about that the heads of bill were published before mm. this report, so would you be willing to, I suppose is a better way of putting this, if you agree with those six powers, would you be willing to make further amendments to this uh, legislation to incorporate the points that are being made? Well, I, I'd start by saying a lot of those powers the ODC does have and okay. will have uh, under the bill. Uh, one of them, which I think is a regulatory enforcement agreement, mm. that is not really appropriate for the ODCE because the ODCE is not actually a regulator. It doesn't have a connection with the companies that it's enforcing company law vis-a-vis. Mm. -vis. It's different if you think about it like the Commission for Energy Regulation. There's a licensing maybe or a regulatory mm. relationship between the companies and uh, the regulator. So that's, it's not so appropriate. But uh, then there are other ones outside of those six powers in the regulatory toolkit, such as deferred prosecution agreements. Those are really matters, as you probably appreciate, for the Director of Public Prosecutions, because again, you would want a, a centralized approach to all of that. Um, but yes, if, 
if it turns out that uh, the powers that are in the heads of bill as they are now need some sort of addition or finessing in order to make them a bit more like the LRC, if it turns out that, that the government in looking at the LRC recommendations see that there need to be changes, then, then yes, of course. Thank you. Yeah. And then, and then uh, I suppose going back to the first point, I mean, are you satisfied uh, in terms of the level of cooperation and interaction between the ODC at present with the Gardaí and with the DPP? The ODC have a very good working relationship with the Gardaí and they also have a very good working relationship um, with a lot of other organisations and have memoranda of understanding in place with, with some of them as well. So the central bank would be one of those organisations, the revenue commissioners. Again, there would be a lot of um, sharing of knowledge between the, the, those organisations and also with the um, with IASA, the accounting um, and uh, auditing supervisory authority there would be a lot of uh, a very close working relationship between all, all of those organizations and i suppose we, within ireland we have the scale to do that we are small whereas some of the international comparators where they have a large corporate crime agency they would be of a much bigger scale for example the uk um, tackling very serious um, cases of wrongdoing uh, whereas we would we would work collaboratively within the existing structures and speciality streams. Okay, uh, and then my, my final question is in relation to Brexit. Um, uh, last week, um, Barclays uh, sought permission to transfer 190 billion euro worth of assets uh, to their Dublin branch, and there's going to be a lot of uh, that happening. Um, uh, I, I suppose, A, uh, is this being observed closely, and B, are resources being given? I mean, you know, obviously, this is a, a turbulent time um, in terms of the economy of these islands and indeed Europe, um, and there's going to be a lot of uh, moving around. Um, are you satisfied that the level of resources within the ODC and uh, you know is commensurate with the you know with, with the level and scale of finances that are being transferred to the state and to uh, you know to be resident in this state? So this kind of goes back to my point earlier that. The ODC is not uh, the regulator, so it would be a matter for the central bank and, mm. and the Department of Finance to make sure that there are sufficient resources to, to mm. supervise. It, which takes me then mm. to my very final question. Yeah. Everything that I've heard in your responses does point to the need for an umbrella agency to, to join up all the dots here. Um, and you know, I put it again. Um, I, I do appreciate your responses. That you know, ultimately the minister and government maybe need to reflect on that. But you know, would it be, in your considerable experience collectively uh, as a team, uh, would it, you know, would there be resistance within the ODCE or the department to the idea of an umbrella organisation? You know, going cross departments. Uh, to, you know, to, to, to ensure that all of the different elements are working together. I mean, you know, I can't state this enough. I mean, our state was bankrupted, and we all would agree because of the utter recklessness of people who we trusted, uh, you know, in, in very important positions. And you know, we, we cannot, you know, we cannot allow that, particularly in terms of our international reputation, a location for investment to repeat itself. And you know, the, 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 the Fitzpatrick trial has been referenced by one of my committee colleagues earlier as an example. So I just, you know, I would like to get a sense, would you be resistant um, to the concept of an umbrella agency uh, or, or, or would you be supportive? Uh, well, Senator, I I don't know the answer to whether or not there would be resistance. It's a relatively new recommendation. Yeah. Uh, and as I said, up to now, the emphasis has been on making sure yeah. that the different areas of expertise work as closely together as they, they possibly can yeah. uh, while developing their areas of expertise. Um, speaking just personally, if uh, my only concern would be that if you have one big agency, do you risk losing speciality expertise? I, I don't know, uh, because again, you know, your, your pool of resources is only so much. But uh, I, I'm not aware of any resistance to it so far. Um, 
people are openly looking at it, but it, it, it would need definitely. One thing we know from putting together this general scheme is that what's very important from an enforcement point of view is clarity of your mandate, exactly what it is you're meant to be going after. Mm. Um, different offences bring different challenges uh, and therefore different levels of, of expertise. Um, so it, it just it needs a great deal more thought, I, I would think. Um, but I'm not aware that anybody's against it at this okay. stage. Yeah. Thank you. If I could just ask one final question myself. Um, again, it's in relation to the Law Reform Commission report that came out on the 23rd of October 2018. Um, the report also recommends the economic regulators should have the power to impose significant financial sanctions, I suppose administrative financial sanctions, you know, I suppose without bringing a criminal sanction. Is that something you're considering within the heads of the bill? Uh, no, there are, there are no. As it stands, ODC do have a limited ability to impose administrative sanctions in the context of, of audit, where a director of a company um, is culpable in, a, in an audit offence. But other than that, they don't have it. Um, they, they're really more focused on uh, prosecuting through the courts and okay. getting people to do that. The whole question of administrative sanctions in, brings in broader constitutional and implications for the wider criminal justice system. So again, it's, it's one that's being looked at uh, okay. more broadly. Okay, thank you very much. Any further questions? Um, well, that, that now concludes um, for today. I would like to thank you for coming here today to brief the committee. Um, the, that concludes all of our business on today's agenda. The Joint Committee is now adjourned until Tuesday the 19th of February at 4 p.m. Thank you very much for your cooperation. Thank you. Thank you.